Thanks, Anne, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Trevor Pugh. I'm from the Princess Margaret Cancer Center in, uh, in Toronto. Uh, I'm sort of tasked with sort of the flyover of cancer genomics in general. So basically, I'm going to try to strip this right back to absolute basics. What is the cell? What's DNA? And then move pretty rapidly into next generation sequencing and how we use uh, these techniques to understand the cancer genome. Uh, so I'm a PI at Princess Margaret. I run a cancer genomics lab, really focused on translation and application of next gen sequencing. So really trying to not just read out the genome, but also um, make sense of it, interpret it, and link a lot of what we see in the cancer genome across cancers uh, to, uh, to treatment. Uh, so the way I've structured this talk is really what is cancer, what is DNA, moving into next-gen sequencing, and then the last, probably third of the talk, is basically a published case report. Uh, you can read the paper, but basically we'll go through this basically end of one example, how a group in uh, British Columbia at the time really went through using whole genome sequencing and RNA sequencing to make a treatment decision and what happened to that patient uh, over time. Uh, I guess a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm from Vancouver originally. I did my undergrad and PhD at, at the BC Cancer Agency. I had my postdoc at the Broad Institute and Dana-Farber, really much more in the computational biology space. Uh, I did a clinical laboratory fellowship uh, while I was in Boston as well. And coming to Princess Margaret, I sort of sit between those two worlds. Part of it is in the, the traditional research space, the other part really being in thinking about how to apply uh, genomics in the pathology department uh, and in a translational genomics lab. So the whole point of this module is to understand how cancer genomes are different from normal genomes, uh, understand how we can use bioinformatics to measure those differences, uh, to measure those differences, thinking about different types of genomic assays and how they can read out and inform different types of genome variation, and as I alluded to, how we can take what is essentially a list of differences and assign those uh, clinical relevance and actionability. So I said I was going to start really simple. We are all made of cells. Cancer arises from a cell. Um, if you have a cell, you can have a cancer of that cell. And really, this is sort of the guiding principle um, for really where cancer starts. Um, regardless of the cancer type, um, regardless of the original cell type, the common theme is that cancer actually starts to reuse and reuse more or less the same molecular pathways, regardless of, uh, of what cell uh, it's derived from. Uh, all cells have DNA, or <clears throat> most cells have DNA. Uh, I just want to show the most personal slide, which is my human genome. This is what one of my blood cells looks like if you drop it uh, onto a slide. So these are my chromosomes. If you drop a slide on, or a cell onto a slide, you sort of get the smattering of, uh, of, uh, of chromosomes. And in the old-fashioned days, you'd take a picture like this, and literally with uh, scissors and tape, make a paste up that looks like this, where you basically put the chromosomes by eye, side by side. You read these banding patterns and look for differences, again, by eye down the microscope, looking for sort of banding patterns that happen to be different. And I wanted to show this generally as a benchmark. This is where normal cells are coming from. This is where cancer cells are coming from as well. A minor change, in, or sometimes a major change in these genomes uh, can result in a shift from a, a normal, healthy genome here uh, to a cancer genome. So here's a, a karyotype from a, a brain cancer. Uh, you can just tell by eye it's completely different. There are way more chromosomes there than there should be. Some chromosomes are missing parts. Pieces of one chromosome are being attached to another, to a, another chromosome. This is really where next generation sequencing shines because now we can start to read out all these different types of cancer genome variation, not just at the microscopic level, but really at the, at the uh, molecular level. Uh, this is actually a quote from my postdoc supervisor, Matthew Mearson. He loved this example of um, really all happy cells are like each unhappy cell is actually unhappy in its own way. So this is actually a, a plot uh, from circles.ca. This is actually a, a Martin Shvinsky's uh, site from the BC Cancer Agency. This is actually not showing a cancer genome. This is actually showing all the ways that a genome can or could be modified. And these arcs are actually showing the regions of the genome that are related to each other, have a similar sequence. Uh, if you zoom in here just onto this one little segment, each of these tracks refers to one of the different ways a cancer genome or a genome can be different from another. Uh, point mutations are the most famous single base pair changes. Uh, copy number alterations, really wholesale changes of thousands, hundred thousands or uh, millions of bases of the genome being gained or lost. Uh, structural rearrangements, taking a piece from one chromosome, attaching it to another. Of course, within all of these are the genes and the elements that regulate them, right? regulatory elements, uh, pathways that those genes uh, encode, and there's a lot of redundancy in the human genome. Really, these homologous sequences, these epigenetic modifications, really layer upon layer of regulatory control on top of the DNA sequence itself.
the other lesson with uh, cancer is you don't sort of get this boom of massive uh, aneuploidy or copy number or mutational changes at once, but rather cancer is actually thought to sort of uh, accumulate mutations over time, and really it's not until the acquisition of a driver mutation uh, where really you start, where th things really start to take off, where you start to get this highly unstable genome, highly unstable cell that then is prone to acquiring additional mutations such as crop member alterations, and some of those actually being driven by uh, therapy itself. And really this model actually is a great paper by uh, Mike Stratton, really is the number of mutations accumulate over time until you acquire what are, have now been termed drivers. And really one of the, still one of the central challenges in cancer genome research is to differentiate a driver mutation from the inevitable passenger mutations that accumulate, accumulate over time but are not thought to have biological function. Uh, yeah, I mentioned external forces like drug treatment can select for specific clones. I just have a slide later on about this idea of clonal selection within a complex cell population. Uh, but before I got there, I want to talk a little bit about mutation burden, this idea of the number of mutations uh, in each cell. And really, uh, in this analysis here from uh, the Broad Institute, just looking at the number of mutations across all cancer types, uh, across all cancer types, and the general trend being that uh, pediatric cancers and uh, hematological malignancies being relatively low mutation rate. The cancers associated with environmental exposure, smoking, sun exposure, have the higher mutation rate. I'm not so sure about hamburgers, but um, in general, higher mutation rates on the right-hand side of the slide. But really, it's not a hard and fast rule. At the population level, yes, these cancer types have low mutation, uh, have low mutation rates. But I've sort of highlighted two sort of anecdotal uh, exceptions to the rule. Uh, neuroblastomas is actually from work. Uh, I did while well. I was a postdoc there, this sort of mysterious case with an amazing number of mutations, actually just as many mutations as a, a late-stage lung cancer. This was actually a, uh, a child with neuroblastoma. In this case, they, had, they were the only patient with two hits in a DNA repair gene. They had a mutation uh, of one copy of, the, of MLH1 and a deletion of the other copy. This cancer cell had lost its ability to repair its DNA. Uh, so in this case, we had a nice molecular reason for what would be expected to be a low mutation rate cancer to have a very, very high mutation rate. Uh, the exact opposite story here in melanoma. This is actually the only melanoma uh, in that study that did not have sun exposure. It's actually a, a tumor on the bottom of a patient's foot. Just extraordinarily bad luck. They had uh, cancer of the same cell of origin as other traditional melanomas. Uh, but again, very different at the molecular level, even though down the microscope, the cells looked like melanoma. It was really different at a fundamental level. Uh, this very famous slide has been updated um, actually several times. Really this idea of hallmarks of cancer, really the idea to take these biological themes or biological processes that are active in cancer and assign them into uh, relatively few distinct characteristics. So this circle has actually grown quite a bit since the original uh, Hanahan Weinberg um, hallmarks of cancer paper. But really this idea of tumor cells acquiring abnormal activities using pathways that are already active in normal cells. So really this idea of cancer being dysregulation of normal cell processes and often turning on pathways in a cell that they otherwise should not be active in, driving, you know, sustained proliferative signaling, uh, evading growth suppressors, et cetera, et cetera. Really this idea of just reusing pathways that already exist. Uh, this idea that uh, oncogenic somatic mutations target a core set of these biological functions. And you'll hear me use a, a couple of terms, this idea of driver mutations or oncogenes. These are really thought to be sort of the activating mutations, really the, um, the mutations, copy number alterations, rearrangements that drive or activate pathways that shouldn't be, uh, that shouldn't be uh, expressed. And the other category being tumor suppressor genes. These are sort of the cells breaks. These are trying to be turning off pathways, and these are the genes that are commonly deleted or have loss of function mutations. And the whole point of next-gen sequencing is you will read out all of these classes of, uh, of uh, cancer genome variation that then result in a, a cancer phenotype. And this is really still a challenge, especially in these tumors like uh, melanoma, lung cancer, these tumors have thousands of mutations, and the real challenge is to hone in on specifically what are the mutations that drive these tumor tumors, and to treat patients, what can we do about those? How do we actually act upon knowledge uh, of driver of activated drivers and loss of tumor suppressors? Uh, so that sort of brings me to sort of the area I like to work on on a daily basis, which is how do we use targeted therapies, immunotherapies, um, to or bring those to bear on specific tumor types. I've shown two of the most famous examples in this case. These are uh, 
Example of lung adenocarcinoma with an activating mutation of the epidermal growth factor receptor. So a mutation in a receptor very high up on a signaling pathway that activates the entire pathway. Um, sort of the canonical personalized medicine uh, yes, principle has really been this idea that inhibiting this pathway shrinks um, tumors that have these precise mutations. Uh, same sort of story here, metastatic melanoma with activating mutations of BRAF. You can just see by eye. Um, really, this poor patient here is just has you know, covered in uh, metastatic melanoma, and really these very, very dramatic responses, specifically with uh, a BRAF inhibitor, that really hits a lot of those tumors over time. Um, really hits all of those tumors in a targeted way. Uh, the real challenge here is that resistance to these inhibitors inevitably arises. Uh, in almost every case, especially with these targeted therapies, you'll often see these dramatic responses, but then some sort of resistance mechanism will arise because these tumors have such plastic genomes. There's either a subclone that already uh, has that resistance me mechanism, or you've really selected using drugs uh, for a specific uh, cell that has a resistance phenotype. Uh, this idea of linking drugs to genomes is uh, really a, uh, is still a very, very active uh, area of research. This is a paper uh, where uh, Chris Sanders' group took a, basically all the tumor genomes in the uh, Cancer Genome Atlas at the time, picked out relatively few genes that have been linked to pathways, and what they found is that you really don't want to look at these genes in a single way. Twelve of those genes were actually being hit not just by point mutation, not just by cough nerve alterations. Really this idea of genes being hit in multiple different ways using multiple different types of cancer genome variation, but having the same phenotypic effect, activation or loss of a tumor suppressor or a cancer driver. Uh, the other big lesson from the study, so the way, way to read this, each column is a cancer type, each row is a gene. And they've drawn a little pathway diagram down here to sort of group these genes into themes. Uh, so the lessons from the study, uh, lesson number one was drug alterations cut across cancer types. So in this case, FGFR activation happens in bladder and two other cancers as well. So really this idea of one drug, one cancer type really starting to fall away as you get this high resolution view of the cancer genome. Combination therapies may be effective, and actually this is no longer may, they are effective in tumors with compound pathway alterations. So in this case, uh, these cancer types that have activation of both the pic 3 ca AKT pathway and the CDK uh, and the CDK pathway, really these idea of uh, coincident mutations hitting two pathways at the same time, so there's potential for combination clinical trials. And the other lesson that fit, uh, at least half of the uh, tumors had at least two disruptive druggable pathways. So their call in this paper was really for let's think about combination therapies rather than trying to hit these pathways one by one or we do um, inevitably see resistance to, think, uh, to single agents. The other compounding factor, not only are these tumors hit in multiple, or these tumor cells hit in multiple ways, they then spin off progeny, and these progeny then go on to evolve in their own way, and they actually result in uh, tumor masses like this, where you have a blue cancer cell that has then perhaps given uh, rise to a, red, or, uh, to a red subclone and a yellow subclone. You can actually see these microscopically, maybe not so great here with the light, but Really what's happened here is you now have um, cells that inherit the cancer genome alterations from their parental cells, but then go on to acquire their own resistance mutations or their own uh, oncogenic drivers. So even if you have a therapy that's very effective against the blue, the blue clone, there's a potential that the red and the yellow clone may still persist, and there's a need to monitor and overcome, uh, over overcome the drivers that are active in those subclones as well. Actually, a nice sort of diagram of this... Um, uh, published uh, six years ago now is really this idea of starting with your tumor clone, the acquisition of multiple clones over time. So each of these uh, clones is defined by different cancer genome uh, alterations. You might have a yellow mutation here, might have an orange uh, cough number alteration here, might have a rearrangement here in purple. Uh, the idea that then you have uh, chemotherapy acting on all of these clones at once and the risk that a resistant clone may be somewhere in that larger cellular population that they may, that may uh, then persist and then have a space into which can then, uh, uh, can then grow and acquire additional cancer genome alterations. So the real challenge here to not just look at cancer genomes at one point in time, but really having the ability to sample multiple, tumor sa uh, multiple samples of the actual tumor tissue, or I'll allude to later a little bit of work in uh, cell-free DNA sequencing, really trying to read these, out, these uh, subclonal populations and resistance mechanisms out uh, more routinely, rather than trying to require on, uh, uh, rely on diagnostic material from four or five years uh, prior.
Uh, the other challenge is these tumors will also change and evolve as they move throughout the body, as they metastasize. Uh, so in this case, uh, some work by yeah, Peter Campbell in the UK, really starting with a primary tumor and then seeing uh, metastatic masses that then, just like in clonal evolution, start to acquire additional cancer genome alterations. So we have this primary tumor, spins out a second metastasis, spins out a tertiary metastasis. And this is really where uh, clinical interpretation is extraordinarily challenging. First of all, how do we sample all of these metastases, cell-free DNA, maybe one way to get there, uh, but also what do we do about them? Do we have to treat this MET, or is there some clonal truncal mutation that you could really hit that could blow away all of these METs? Certainly in the BRAF mutation uh, example I showed you, that was very effective. You do see these dramatic responses, but then you also see these dramatic um, resistances as well. Uh, so why do next-generation sequencing, or why do molecular testing for cancer uh, in general? Uh, obviously, treatment, you want to see what are the genome alterations, what targeted therapies may work. Uh, are you already resistant to a drug? <laughs> uh, are there specific drugs that you cannot metabolize, drug resistance to met uh, metabolism? Uh, I'll talk a little bit uh, later on about an inherited uh, hereditary cancer syndrome, it's really where you're born already with a loss of function mutation of a tumor suppressor, really with a very, very high predisposition to cancer. These are very early onset cancers uh, in these patients specifically. Uh, and prognosis, what type of cancer do you have? Even if there's not a goal to assign a patient to a targeted therapy, what we've seen with increasing number of tumors being sequenced or analyzed is that there are multiple molecular subtypes, even within breast cancer, lung cancer, brain cancer, virtually all cancers, there are distinct molecular subtypes, some of which do better uh, clinically than others. Uh, so I'll just pause here quickly. I don't know if anyone has any questions about sort of the overview of cancer genomics in general before I dive into a little more of the, um, I guess, N of 1 single patient analysis. Okay, so the first part of the talk is sort of that overview. Here's what the landscape of cancer genomics looks like. Uh, that's great. For a single patient, the question is not so much what are, what are other cancers like, but what are the targets in my cancer? How is it different from other cancers in sequence, mutation, polymorphisms, all the things I just talked about, structure, copper number alteration, translocations. How is it functionally different? Even if the genes are altered, what genes are expressed, what genes are disrupted, and are there external forces? Um, are there, is there viral infection? Is this cancer associated with uh, viral infection? How is that cancer different from other cancers uh, of this type? And not only what is the list, what are the targets, but what can actually be done about them. Uh, so this is the next part of the talk, probably a little more uh, technical, getting a little uh, closer to uh, the bioinformatics theme. How do we apply next generation DNA sequencing to cancer specifically? So I've grossly simplified this, but this is really how the four critical steps um, for genomics in general happen. Uh, you extract genomic DNA and RNA from a cell, biopsy, blood, cell-free DNA, some sort of extraction. You make a library. A library is essentially DNA that's been made compatible with a machine that can read DNA. So basically you take this DNA, in the case of Illumina sequencing, which I'm almost going to be showing exclusively, you put little adapters on either end that are unique to that machine. You then load that DNA onto the machine, like an Illumina sequencing device. That generates a huge text file of A's, C's, T's, and G's. And this is really where things are much less uh, standardized, sort of the more and more custom you get, the less standardized it becomes. The alignment is very standardized, and as you get down to how to interpret a genome, uh, that's really um, more lab specific. Uh, but essentially those are the, really the four steps. Extract DNA, make libraries, put them on a machine, and then analyze the data. Uh, so I analyzed, I uh, mentioned a, a big text file. This is literally a, uh, a I run from a, a project that I was running. Essentially, each of these is a DNA sequencing read, 75 base pairs, and this is 25 reads. On a single Illumina high seq so conventional machine, one lane of an eight-lane flow cell generates 600 million of these. So you get millions and millions of A, C's, T's, and G's. And the first step is to compare them to something. What do any of these mean? No one wants to look through 600 millions of these uh, all at once. Uh, that's where this idea of a bioinformatics pipeline comes in. It's really exactly like an oil pipeline. You want to have your text file at the beginning. You want to run it through a series of software uh, of software modules, akin to sort of a yeah, pipe module. Um, but essentially, you want to run all these software uh, programs in a systematic way, end to end, to go from raw DNA sequencing, to a raw, raw DNA sequence to a, a list of variants at the end. Uh, and building one of these also very much like a uh, like an oil pipeline. You want to really run through a series of software that are all compatible with each other. You want these softwares to really link up um, and, uh, end to end without leaks. 
and you want to put them together in a, a really a systematic way. And I'll talk, I'll have a slide based on each of these steps. Uh, really, the idea of taking the first um, sort of that text file, align it to something, some sort of reference. In this case, we use a human genome reference sequence. Anyone can download this off the internet. I, of course, have a copy on my laptop, and you probably will by the end of this workshop as well. Uh, Pre-processing, really um, sort of cleaning up that alignment in areas that are very difficult to, to align. I'll show you an example of that. Uh, Q QC metrics, did all your reads align to human? Did you do a human experiment? Do you have a bunch of other sequences that are not necessarily human? Um, did the experiment work? Um, does it look like the cancer that you uh, are studying? Variant calling, calling out mutations, translocations, copy number alterations. And I've just put in slightly, uh, basically in gray down at the bottom, how do we interpret these variants and how do we write a clinical report to communicate this analysis to clinicians who may act on it? Um, really the go-to place for almost every pipeline certainly I've worked on is some, adapt some uh, modification of the genome analysis toolkit best practices. And this is sort of basically a more technical version of the slide I just showed you, really the going from raw reads, going to it through an alignment, going through some uh, cleanup of that alignment, some variant calling, and then um, basically tidying up those variant calls. So this is actually described in great de detail on the Broad Institute's website. Another great tool just to bring all your attention to is the Picard suite of tools, which is really a, a QC, a collection of uh, QC tools that really look at the output of this pipeline and allow you to compare it across runs. Um, this um, best practices uh, workflow actually came out of a lot of the um, non-cancer work being done uh, really across the world. And for cancer genomics, we've inevitably had to modify this and bring in our own cancer-specific collars. So it's very challenging to take tools that were written specifically for germline, germline analysis and apply those specifically to cancer. And I've just listed some of the tools here for doing variant calling specifically um, for cancer, and then also the types of cancer genome variation that we're looking at in cancer that may not be certainly as frequent in uh, germline or, uh, or normal cell genomes. So this is really step one. It's basically, if you took that big text file I showed earlier, aligned all those reads to the, uh, the human genome reference, this is really what you get. This is a software called uh, Integrative Genomic Viewer. I think there's a little tutorial session specifically on how to use this tool. I'll show you a lot of screenshots of how this works, or how to read these screenshots. Uh, but just to orient you, the chromosome is here along the top. So just like the chromosomes I showed you earlier, they've taken that little banded karyogram and put it horizontally along the top. So we're looking at this portion of this chromosome. In this case, we're only looking at 92 base pairs at a time. In white is the human genome reference sequence, and in gray are the, is a histogram of the number of reads aligned to each base. Uh, these are all the sequencing reads. This is the data I showed you on that slide earlier. And you can already see that data represented in this way is a lot, lot more human readable than it was uh, just in the flat text format. First of all, all these reads have more or less the same sequence. I've intentionally chosen a region that doesn't have any variation. Uh, so in this case, all these regions basically match perfectly to the human genome reference. And now we want to run uh, callers that look for differences between our data and the reference. And there's actually a Wikipedia article called Short Read Sequence Alignment. There are many, many ways to do alignments. Um, BWA is the one I've used here, but there are many, many others. Um, so really you want to choose a specific line or appropriate to your biological question. Uh, this is a cartoon of the exact type of data I just showed you. So the human genome reference being here along the top. Uh, here's chromosome 1, chromosome 5. Here are all the sequencing reads, and here are the types of uh, genome variation we want to find using bioinformatics. Point mutation, single mutation difference from the reference, an indel, assertion or, an insertion or a deletion of a, uh, a base or multiple bases uh, in a small region, missing DNA, so tumor suppressors in regions that don't have any reads whatsoever. If you don't put DNA into your a sequencing device, you're not going to get reads out, or that region is not represented. That looks like a deletion. A hemizygous deletion, so one of the two chromosomes is deleted. That means you get half as much data as you'd expect. A copy number gain, some of these oncogenes get uh, amplified tens or hundreds of times. As a result, you get tens or hundreds of DNA sequencing reads mapping to that region. Uh, and translocation breakpoint, where you take one piece of one gene, attach it to another piece of another gene, uh, and this is now has brought one gene on chromosome 5 under regulation, under the uh, control of regulatory machinery that are meant for uh, gene on chromosome 1. So these are very powerful uh, oncogenic drivers in cancer. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about pathogenic sequences, but really not everything aligns to the human genome sequence, especially in cancers like uh, cervical cancer, for example, that where they're 
uh, one of the original uh, drivers of those cancers is exposure to, uh, uh, to virus, HPV, EBV, et cetera. In this case, those reads, of course, come through in your DNA sequencing reads, and you can align those to other, re to, uh, other references beyond the human genome reference. Uh, and here's sort of a cheat sheet of sort of the ways that we can think about and, um, and sequence DNA, RNA, uh, and start to infer the presence of proteins that DNA is wrapped around. Uh, whole genome sequencing, this has put all the DNA into sequencing or into the sequencing device uh, and sequence it. It's whole genome sequencing. Exome, this is focusing specifically on exons, so only the coding portions uh, of these genes. Uh, much, much cheaper. This is probably 1%, <laughs> looking at 1% of the genome relative to the uh, whole genome. Targeted gene sequencing, this is what we often will use in the clinical labs. Much smaller targeted panels, much more cost effective, much easier to interpret. Uh, targeted variant genotyping, this is getting even more focused, looking at single basis, single mutation. Uh, very high throughput, very inexpensive, um, the least comprehensive test, but certainly the most uh, clinically actionable. Uh, and epigenome modifications, really looking at methylated uh, promoters or other regulatory regions. Uh, RNA sequencing, looking at the sort of the functional output of DNA, looking at transcriptome sequencing, uh, either looking at whole RNA sequencing. Um, targeted RNA sequencing is also a uh, uh, protocol that's being increasingly used in uh, clinical labs. And microRNA sequencing, looking specifically at small microRNAs um, <clears throat> that uh, are essentially confer regulator, regulatory control uh, on gene expression. Uh, and I'm not really going to talk at all about uh, protein mapping or DNA fingerprint mapping. Actually, there may be an entire uh, bioinformatics workshop on this topic specifically. Uh, I did want to, I want to show you real data as often as possible. So here's the exact same sample sequence using genome sequencing, exome sequencing, and RNA sequencing focused on a very important cancer gene, KRAS, so the way you read this. Um, so here's the region, for, uh, 49 uh, KB regions, so we're zoomed out quite a bit further than we were on the previous slide. Here's KRAS down here on the bottom, so exon, uh, exon 1 down at this end, so this is on the minus strand going from right to left. Uh, whole genome sequencing, you just get a sea of reads, so all those gray sequencing reads I showed you earlier, each of those just shows up as just a little tick on this mark, on this uh, display, because we're zoomed so, uh, so far out. Exome sequencing, we've essentially used a, uh, a reagent that will allow us to only focus our sequencing reads on the exons of interest. This is where the coding mutations, uh, where the coding mutations live. This really is much more, uh, much more cost effective because you don't have to look at the, the reads in the intervening regions that you may not be interested in if your question is specifically around coding sequences. And RNA sequencing, you let the cell do the select, the exonic selection for you. So in this case, the cell has spliced out the intron, so all of your reads are only mapped uh, to exons as they should be. You also get the added information of what exons are attached to which exons, and this is also quantitative. So if you have very, very high coverage of specific genes, those genes are expressed at a higher level uh, than genes that have low coverage are expressed at a, a low level. I use the phrase whole exome and whole genome sequencing. Uh, that's really a bit of a misnomer. They really don't actually measure anything, or in, uh, probably more specifically, we don't have great bioinformatic methods to assign absolutely every, uh, every single sequencing read uniquely to a portion, to a region of the human genome. Uh, this is actually a slide from, uh, from my own work, work in neuroblastoma. Uh, in this case, each little tiny, tiny slice here is a, is a, a neuroblastoma tumor. Um, and the y-axis uh, the y-axis here is a single exon. So each little slice going this way uh, is an exon. One means that we are completely confident in where those reads were aligned and our ability to find mutations uh, in those exons. And so these are sort of the regions where we had no doubt we can find mutations, we have good coverage, we're, we're well powered. As you get towards the bottom of this plot, you can see the, our confidence in following mutations essentially drops to zero, not just in the exome sequences, which are in these uh, purple, but also in the whole genome sequences as well. And this is really sort of a blind spot in the genome where we just, they're highly repetitive, our reads are short, we just cannot be confident that our read, that uh, in our ability to find mutations necessarily in this region. Uh, the other interesting technical aspect is that the blind spots in the genome are often, well, down here they're essentially the same uh, as exome sequencing, but often they're actually not exactly the same as exome sequencing. And this is due to differences in read length, uh, mappability, and just the sheer depth of sequencing. Uh, with exome sequencing, since you are able to focus the capacity of your DNA sequencer on a relatively smaller genomic footprint, you can now sequence those regions to much, uh, to much deeper coverage and might have much greater confidence in the mutation calls at each of those bases. So I tend not, I still use the terms whole genome and whole exome sequencing because the concept is you are really trying to be as comprehensive as possible. 
but it does not necessarily mean 100% of the genome or exome. Francis? So, on the whole exome, what would you say is the percentage of the exome that are trapped? And what part compared to the best guess? Uh, so, I think at the time it was about 80% of the whole exome was covered at, I think in this case it was only 14x was needed to be called covered. I think that number has probably gone up to 90 plus now, um, but I think this is there's still a lot of room for a lot of um, sort of custom panels to look, especially at these hard to read uh, regions, and to complement not just the Lumina se to complement Lumina sequencing with other sequencing technologies, longer read sequencing technologies that basically generate much larger reads that are much easier to map across these hard to uh, capture and sequence regions. You mentioned earlier. Uh, I have one slide on PacBio. I'm not going to cover those technologies very in great depth, actually, in this talk. Uh, beyond, are they used quite a bit in translational Yeah, rarely. I don't really know of really any clinical labs who are currently using those technologies due to um, uh, problems specifically with background error rate. In clinical labs, especially, we're quite focused on uh, point mutation detection. Those technologies have very high background point mutation error rate. Uh, I think they are going to find a place at some point of resolving large structural variation, uh, but they really have to need to compete on not just um, sequence quality, but also uh, cost as well. Certainly dollar per base, it's very hard today to beat a limited sequencing. Uh, so that's the data that's by far the most ubiquitous. Um, I wanted to just give some uh, context to uh, what RNA sequencing data looks like. This is actually a plot I like to make for all of our RNA sequencing data sets. So for a single patient, I like to just plot all of the exons and just say what is the expression level for all those exons, just to sort of get a feel for what's the dynamic range of our data. I actually do this for almost every data set I get. Before I really do anything, I make a distribution, I look at what is the shape of the data. And I show it in this case because uh, this is actually data from a, a breast cancer patient and we want to know what type of breast cancer do they, uh, are they? Are they ER positive? Are they PR positive? What specific markers are they expressing and at what, and at, uh, what level? And what we wanted to do is take the single patient, really just compare it to two reference sets. A tumor from an ER positive breast cancer, an ER negative breast cancer. Uh, the colors are really not showing up great here. In this case, here's uh, the ER, right here in red, here's the ER, um, the ER transcript. And you can see the, uh, you can see the uh, corresponding transcripts down here in the, in the uh, ER negative breast cancer are really quite low. They're really well below the, uh, the threshold here. Uh, and the patient as well, basically what we want to do is look at, I really can't even see it. Uh, <laughs> what we, the story here, we uh, essentially want to take these reference genes, look at their level in the patient, and, look, and basically compare those uh, to reference sets as well. So if these dots are higher up in the patient and corresponding to a specific threshold in a training, training set of ER positive breast cancer or ER uh, negative. Uh, the third type of uh, cancer genome variation probably being used more and more, use, um, being read out more and more by next-gen sequencing is uh, epigenetic modification. In this case, this is another IGB screenshot. I've shown MLH1 here along the bottom. Here's the promoter that controls this gene. And in this region, methylation of this promoter um, has very strong uh, control over expression of that gene. So in this case here is normal tissue. This promoter is unmethylated and this actually results in normal expression of LMLH1 in normal tissue. Uh, and here's the exact same type of data, the exact same assay run on uh, endometrial carcinoma. And you can see the promoter has essentially turned completely red. So what's been done in this experiment is they've taken the DNA, they've treated it with bisulfite, and that converts all of the unprotected Cs uh, into a T. So this is uh, into a T, and this is really indicative of a, of, a, of essentially a promoter with a whole series of Cs in the CPG island are unmethylated, and uh, therefore result in over or in normal expression, normal tissue, but silencing of this gene uh, in cancer. Uh, just like mutation calling, this uh, this assay is completely quantitative as well. So you can see this promoter is methylated in this tumor, but you can actually see a, a sort of a shadow of blue signal as well. And this is still persisting from normal cells that are also present in, in the same uh, tumor tissue. As sort of a cheat sheet, great for um, sort of exams, uh, sort of coming up with the experimental design. 
really none of these assays really stand completely alone. Genome sequencing is great for sequence mutations, half number alterations, etc. I won't have to go through this in uh, great detail. But really think about having to um, not just read out these sources of cancer genome variation in one shot, but really start to think about uh, integration of these types of mutations. So a experimental, de experimental design I'll use quite frequently is actually a combination of both exome and RNA sequencing. Exome to get the sort of the parts list, what are the mutations, what are the copy number alterations. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about purity and ploidy, how do we um, sort of challenges on working with clinical samples. Uh, but not only what are the mutations, but what ones are actually expressed, which ones are actually being used by the cell, which ones result in loss of function or loss of, the, loss of expression of a certain gene, which mutations are expressed at a very, very high level. Uh, MethylSeq as well being very useful for looking at regions that, or uh, uh, genome variation that can result in loss of gene expression, but are, you're completely blind to using exome sequencing. So I'm going to go through this list sort of one by one. So the next the sort of series of the talk is really just marching through what are these types of cancer genome variation and what do they look like at the read level and how do we detect them and think about them. So I'm going to start with uh, somatic mutations, sort of the most famous type of mutation, a single base pair change. Uh, I want to start again with what, do, what does uh, genome variation look like in normal cells. So in this case, here's a uh, sequencing read stack. I put the reference down here on the bottom. And I've shown here a difference. So in this case, half the reads at this exact position have a C, and half the reads have a T, T being the one that doesn't match the, uh, the reference. In this case, this is a heterozygous variant, so I showed you those chromosomes at the beginning. You have two copies of every gene. In this case, one gene has a C, one gene has a T. And uh, next-gen sequencing is, very, is highly quantitative. You can literally just count the number of Cs, count the number of Ts, and get more or less a 50-50 balance. In cancer, specifically in... Um, um, in cancer, specifically in applied or uh, clinical genomics, this is confounded by a few features that are, uh, a few features of the tissue that we're actually given to work with. The first one being that the tumor tissue uh, often yields variable DNA quality and quantity from tissues that are used in routine diagnosis. So in cancer, certainly in cancer diagnosis, uh, cancer biopsies or surgical samples are excised. They're then fixed um, with, for, uh, with formalin and then embedded in a paraffin wax uh, cube or paraffin wax uh, cassette. And this is because um, that type of reagent is very easy for sectioning and looking at cells down the microscope. Unfortunately, it's absolutely terrible for DNA, uh, just illustrated by this slide here. So this is a DNA ladder. These are 12 samples all taken from the same cancer type from the same hospital. Uh, one sample gave a nice high molecular weight DNA, much higher than the ladder. You can see as you move from left to right, you get increasingly worse DNA. This is actually highly fragmented. Uh, luckily, Illumina sequencing is relatively short uh, sequencing reads, so sort of about 50 base pairs at the low end to 300 at the, at the high end. So even these small fragments are still useable for DNA sequencing, but there is this addi additional challenge of just making this DNA uh, sequenceable or compatible with the uh, with Illumina sequencers. Uh, the other challenge is that tumors are not just perfectly homogeneous masses of cancer cells. So actually a mixture of tumor cells and invading or surrounding um, normal cells. So this is actually a screenshot from a laser capture microdissection experiment. This is a, uh, a lung cancer that's metastasized to a lymph node. So it's already very rich in immune, uh, in lymph node cells, immune cells. Uh, what we've done here is actually have circled all the tumor deposits. And in this case, to enrich the number of uh, cancer cells for analysis, we use the laser to cut out these cells and capture those and then do uh, DNA extraction from uh, purified cells. Um, and sequencing has gotten cheaper and cheaper. Uh, a secondary approach has arisen where we'll just sequence all of this DNA together and sequence this actually to great depth instead. So instead of just generating 15 reads, like I showed in that germline example, we'll generate 150 or, 150, uh, or 1,500 or 15,000. Just sequence past the normal in the search for uh, somatic mutations in uh, highly impure tumors. Uh, so you may hear this concept of contaminating stromal cells referred to as tumor purity or also tumor content. Those are the two buzzwords that you'll see to describe this idea of tumors being a mixture of cancer cells and non-cancer cells. Uh, the other challenge I touched on earlier is tumors can have multiple copies of chromosomes. So that assumption of two copies of every gene is broken in cancer. And even more confounding, not every chromosome is necessarily at the same uh, copy state. Chromosome 1 here is at 4 copy, chromosome 2 is at 3 copy. It'll actually be easier to find um, mutations uh, potentially in the, uh, 
the three copy um, the three copy chromosomes versus the uh, four copy chromosome. So you may hear this uh, this uh, concept referred to as aneuploidy or ploidy for short. Uh, one way around this is to sequence um, the DNA from these uh, admixed tumors to death. Um, this is where, really where exome sequencing and certainly targeted sequencing still really has a home. This is the same sample sequenced two ways, genome sequencing and exome sequencing. In this case, a, uh, this uh, region of the genome has only 15 reads. The exome has nearly 140, and that really gave the, uh, the algorithm or the alignment the power to pick up the mutations that actually or the, the DNA fragments that correspond to the reads supporting this actually um, this uh, actionable mutation. So really trying to think about what is the goal of the chromatic analysis? Is it to find absolute every mutation in a comprehensive way, sequencing very, very deeply? Or is it a survey of cancer genome variation with the acknowledgement that in low coverage regions, especially in highly aneuploid or low purity tumors, uh, mutations may be missed? Uh, one benefit of the deep sequencing approach is the ability to infer tumor purity, ploidy, and potentially subclonal structure as well if you have the depth to detect these very rare uh, variants. This is one algorithm we use in my lab called Sequenza. Um, the way to read this plot here, the chromosomes ordered from left to right. Each dot here is a, a variant, a germline variant, or some sort of difference in the genome. And you can see just by eye here sort of these um, copy number changes as you sort of get these shifts in both um, in both allele uh, coverage, but all or allele specific coverage, but also in uh, coverage across the whole genome itself. Uh, the goal being to re to generate these genome wide copy number alteration plots, where you should have one copy of a red allele, one copy of a blue allele. So a normal cell here would just have two blue and red lines that just line up nicely along this baseline. In this case, this is a highly aneuploid tumor with lots of copy number gains, lots of deletions. Actually, this comes from here is quite interesting where. One, cop one allele was just deleted, so that is basically a copy zero. And to stay alive, the cell actually duplicated the other chromosome. So it still has two chromosomes, but they're just both the same. Uh, these algorithms can infer both tumor content and average ploidy. These are inferred from knowledge that normal cells can contribute DNA as well. So you're not necessarily expecting these perfect 50-50 balances between mutant and non-mutant allele. You actually get this sort of dilution effect of having normal uh, cell contamination. And then uh, tools like PyClone, FileWGS is another tool that will take this type of data, they'll take your somatic mutations, and then basically answer the question or give you a readout into what percentage of the cancer cells have these mutations. So in this case, all of these mutations here are all in 100% of the cells. These, these mutations here are in roughly 80% of the cells. And here are subclone mutations that are often visible to shallow whole genome sequencing. Uh, that are, in this case, only visible in 20% of cells, so it's something that you can see with uh, deeper profiling and can then uh, assign to a specific subclone. Uh, in this case, a very important driver mutation present in the, uh, the clonal cancer population. Uh, as Francis alluded to, Illumina sequencing isn't the be-all and end-all of uh, DNA sequencing in the world. Uh, I've just thrown an example here where we use uh, long-read PAC biosequencing to complement what we have from Illumina sequencing. So in this case, we discovered mutations in these two genes here. Uh, we wanted to confirm that those mutations were real. So in this case, this is a point mutation. So the base changed colors. You can see it. This was a, an out-of-frame two-base deletion. And we wanted to ask the question, can we see those in pac -bio data as well? The real challenge with this technology, at least at the time, this is a little old now, um, you can see the real variant shining through, but you can see this background error, um, this background error noise. Uh, what's useful is, the background errors are not necessarily always in the same place, but they're certainly there. So you also have this background effect that can make variant discovery uh, sort of more challenging than it would be in, in that cleaner Illumina data. Um, certainly not really a problem for point mutations because the reads that have the variants are very clear. Uh, this we thought might be more of a challenge in the indel space because the types of errors that the PAC biosequencer makes were specifically insertions and deletions. But you can see this variant was very highly recurrent, so something that we could call out on both uh, platforms. And this is where it's very useful, especially if you're looking for challenging types of cancer genome variation, to have an orthogonal technology to validate um, what was to validate and what was discovered on one platform uh, with something that's more complementary. I want to talk a little bit about depth, why sequence deeper. Uh, in addition to the overcoming the challenges of purity and ploidy, the ability to really detect very, very rare uh, sequencing variants. So I was shown the plot of how, how low can you go in terms of allele fraction and with depth. Um, we actually just published this uh, last year in a CTDNA study. 
Um, exome sequencing is sort of being in this realm of 100 to 200 x coverage. In the clinical lab will sequence our panels to 500 x uh, plus. If you really want to get serious about su uh, subclinality, we'll use highly targeted custom assays to look for these very rare subclones. And uh, circulating tumor DNA, we're currently sequencing those to uh, 25,000 x coverage. Uh, in this case, this is DNA from tumors that have been shed into the bloodstream, so we have to sequence past all the contaminating normal uh, DNA fragments and find the 5, 10, 15 fr uh, fragments of DNA that are derived uh, from tumors. And how do you know where they're from? Uh, you can't, necessarily. So we'll often, certainly in that study, we had the tumor, we had a bone marrow aspirate in the case of multiple myeloma. Uh, actually, I'll just jump here. Um, so we knew what the answer key was, we knew where the somatic mutations were, but we did have several examples where we found mutations, definitely drivers we'd seen before that weren't in the primary tumor. Multiple myeloma is, is multiple right in the name, and you have many of these masses, and I'm convinced those mutations must have been some other mass uh, in the body, but you couldn't necessarily say, we found this in the blood, it's that one versus that one. It's present, but you don't necessarily assign them to a certain tumor mass. Uh, so here's sort of a sort of a now famous uh, cartoon of um, where circulating tumor DNA can come from. So I do want to differentiate cell-free DNA from circulating tumor cells. These are two sort of flavors of a, a similar idea. I'm going to talk about specifically about cell-free DNA. So this is DNA that comes from um, tumor cells that are turning over, dying, shedding their DNA into the bloodstream, and is now dissolved in the plasma portion of, of the blood. There are also circulating tumor cells. They're much harder to find, often at lower, uh, often lower concentrations. These are actually in the cellular portion uh, of, uh, of uh, specifically uh, of blood. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the the liquid portion, which is a combination of 99 plus percent um, normal cells and one percent less uh, uh, cancer cells. Uh, here's what next-gen sequencing data looks like from that type of data. This is from the two papers, TAMS or Two technologies that were published. One's called TAMSEQ. This is a PCR-based approach. You put your primers down. You amplify only your region of interest. You can see highly, highly focused here. Two exons down here. They really wanted to find um, <clears throat> basically mutations only in these exons. Uh, this is a little more challenging in that it requires highly multiplexed uh, polymerase chain reaction. So P high, highly multiplexed uh, PCR. Um, the other challenge here is it's very hard to scale this into larger. Um, sort of larger, especially contiguous regions of the genome. Uh, so another uh, approach using hybrid captures is the same technology used for exome sequencing. You put your bait down on two exons here. This will actually pull down sort of regions of DNA. Uh, this is the method we certainly use in my lab to tile across regions uh, that are very difficult to walk across with PCR, with PCR reactions, uh, but something you can just put in probes, um, not just on exons of interest, but really in any arbitrary region of interest. Uh, it's conceptually exactly the same as exome, as exome sequencing. Rather, you're just focusing the, uh, the panel design uh, much more and sequencing to much, much greater depth. Uh, the other benefit of circulating tumor DNA is <clears throat> several reports have found that the quantity of cell-free DNA in blood plasma it reflects tumor burden. So if you basically take up all the tumors in the body, add them all together, there's a correlation between how much circulating tumor DNA you find and the number of tumors or size of tumors you have. And the real, um, real potential here is not just looking at CDDNA at one point in time, but starting to monitor and look at uh, changes in tumor burden over time of uh, both a, a fusion in this case, but also uh, in this case they actually baited a specific fusion and monitored the frequency of that uh, tumor-derived fragment in blood over time and compared that to tumor volume. You can actually see there's a very nice take correlation between presence in blood uh, and that tumor in the body as well. Uh, conceptually exactly the same workflow I just showed you earlier. Extract DNA, make a library, sequence it, you just sequence it much, much deeper, and then there's the computational analysis being tailored specifically uh, for finding these very, very low allele uh, fraction mutations. So that was pretty much it for point mutations, sort of single base pair changes. This is now stepping back, looking at much larger changes, gains of uh, whole uh, larger regions of the genome, some, in some cases uh, whole, uh, whole chromosomes. Uh, this didn't come out really well, but this is a, um, a spectral karyotype where basically they have probes for every single chromosome. And what you should see if it was a normal cell is you should have two copies, they should all look like this. You should have two copies of every chromosome, each with its uh, unique color. You'll see that's absolutely not the case in this cancer genome. You have all of these chromosomes that are 
being constructed from other parts of chromosomes, part of chromosome one are being sort of shuffled and reshuffled. Uh, and this is really the, the major challenge in uh, cancer genomics, is these tumors are completely scrambled. And how do we measure that scrambling? But then how do we focus in specifically on the alterations that have clinical meaning? Uh, gains and losses are evident from sequencing data. So I showed you earlier, gains result in more coverage, losses result in less coverage. Here's a, a microarray, uh, microarray being compared to sequencing data, reds being gains at a very high level, making an amplification very obvious from sequencing data, not something necessarily uh, see in, um, uh, in normal cells. This can be done at the genome-wide level using exome and um, whole genome sequencing, but it, it can also be informative in small targeted panels as well. So this is a uh, output from a, a, clinical, uh, a clinical test we run at Princess Margaret. It's very focused, very, uh, they only sequence a few exons from a few genes. But you, can e you can see, even by eye here, um, EGFR amplification, every single exon has much, much higher coverage than the baseline than you'd expect. And the same sort of story in the tumor suppressors, single copy, uh, or sorry, two copy deletions of a, a, a P10. We're basically getting no data whatsoever from the P10 locus, indicative of two copy loss um, of that gene. Uh, the challenge with this type of data is you can see it's relatively noisy. This, you know, this baseline isn't perfectly at zero. This exon's a little wonky. It's a little higher. And this is really the challenge with uh, interpreting a lot of these uh, targeted assays. And this is really where big, not exome-wide, but big, large, multi, you know, hundred gene panels really still have a p uh, place, certainly in clinical sequencing, where the same sort of idea of putting bait specifically into individual genes, now having very... Um, you know, much greater coverage for single gene amplifications, whole, um, whole chromosome arm level losses just by loss of, uh, loss of coverage or uh, gain of coverage. So really reading out the same type of cancer genome variations, gains, losses, rearrangements, using smaller, cheaper uh, targeted panels. Uh, I mentioned translocations, uh, translocations and large intergenic deletions. Really, the uh, sort of the beauty of mesh sequencing to resolve these um, these deletions right to the breakpoint. So you have a read that comes in, it hits this breakpoint, and the rest of the read actually continues over here. So really trying to infer uh, deletions even at the exon level uh, of uh, of two exons that are not necessarily lost uh, in normal cells or in wild type cells. Uh, this is what the real world uh, data looks like. In this case, reading in uh, this is a uh, famous rearrangement in EWS slides where. These reads are mapped very nicely to this region, and you sort of get this pile of what looks like hundreds of mutations. Of course, you'd never have hundreds of mutations like this all in a row. This is actually a, a translocation breakpoint, and the, this side of the read actually should align to the, the, other, uh, the other part in the gene. Same sort of story down here. You have all these soft-clipped reads that are, are viewable right, um, right in the IGB viewer. All these reads are correctly mapped here, and then there's a break, and these reads actually are continuing over uh, in the partner gene. Uh, there are bioinformatics tools to call these out now. These are probably the noisiest tools. The false positive rate is extraordinarily high uh, because sometimes these reads actually have um, highly repetitive sequences or other sequences that make these reads very difficult to map. Uh, and this is uh, further challenged by this concept of chaining translocations. So this is a very complex example uh, <coughs> in prostate cancer where you actually have this chain of four genes all being stitched together in a different way. This is not a nice bioinformatic tool. This is uh, postdoc Mike Berger actually went through and manually linked up all these reads one by one. There's still not a great tool that just magically assembles these highly complex rearrangements. So there still is manual, and manual intervention is still a big part of the downstream uh, enterprise of, uh, of bioinformatics. Uh, in this case, you know, multiple chromosomes, even inter, inter, inter or intra chromosomal rearrangements all being stitching these, uh, these different genes together. Uh, just like mutations, some tumors are highly rearranged, some, uh, some tumor types are, are rearranged at a very, very low level. In this case, here are three lung adenocarcinomas, sort of small, medium, and large number of rearrangements. Here's a neuroblastoma, very rarely rearranged. Apart from this one tumor here, in fact, Molnar and colleagues reported 18% of neuroblastoma have highly focal chromosomes um, with a phenomenon called chromothripsis, where essentially the chromosome has more or less exploded and then stitched itself back together, resulting in many, many breakpoints in a highly focused chromosomal region. A uh, feature of pancreatic cancer as well. Uh, transcriptome sequencing, sequencing RNA. Um, in addition to gene expression, just counting number of reads assigned to each, um, to each gene itself, you can also look at the coverage of individual exons. So in this case, here's a 
the UMPS gene, here's the coding sequence, and the way in this paper here, Malachi Griffith and colleagues has uh, sort of encoded each exon as exon 1, exon 2, exon 3, exon 4, and what you'd expect for this gene is 1 is attached to 2, 2 is attached to 3, you know, everything's sort of stitched together in a methodical way, and, and you should really very rarely see an exon 1 to exon 3 joinder, and that, what, that's exactly what you see in this MIP-101 cell when um, you just sequence it, sequence it without drugs. So here's exon 1, it has a fair amount of coverage. There's good coverage for an exon 1 to 2 junction, very, very poor coverage of an exon 1 to 3 junction. You really would not expect that. And then the rest of the transcript sort of continues on. Exon 2 straps to 3, 3 straps to 4, and the transcript's intact. What happens with this cell line when you treat it with this drug 5-fluorouracil is it starts to use this unusual junction. So you can see the coverage of an exon 1, 3 junction actually jumps up. And this is actually a resistance mechanism of this cell line, specifically to 5-fluorouracil. Start to skip exon 2, and just reads from exon 1, jumps to exon 3, and then keeps going. This is something you'd be completely blind to with any sort of DNA sequencing. This is really happening at the regulatory level. It really speaks to the need to read out the functional effects of, of the genome in addition to essentially the parts list uh, in DNA. I'm sure you've all seen these types of heat maps before. Essentially, they're just huge colored tables of genes by samples. And I think there's an entire, uh, entire module on this, but essentially taking individual samples, clustering them, and then looking for patterns that differentiate two different, sample, uh, two different types of samples based on the presence of specific genes. So essentially, if you can just think of these big matrices as tables of samples and gene types, and all that's really being changed here is what are the order of genes, and zooming in on specific genes that really inform, uh, inform these types. But always know in the back of your mind, the entire matrix is available somewhere. All of those genes have been sequenced, so that data, that data are available, and these heat maps are really just subsets of a overall super matrix. Uh, the other big benefit with highly quantitative data, like RNA sequencing, is the ability to start to compare your data with other uh, with other groups. Uh, this is something we did in four lung tumors of unknown tissue origin. We just wanted to know where those tumors come from. We knew they weren't necessarily lung primary. In this case, we took all these tumors and we clustered them with a, uh, a large set of, of uh, data from healthy tissues. In this case, this is the genotype, the, uh, actually this is the GTEx project, the Genotype Tissue Expression Project, and they're just sequencing tens or hundreds, re hundreds of representations of healthy, uh, healthy tissues, or tissues from healthy individuals. And what's actually surprising to us here, these lung tumors actually um, clustered specifically with smooth muscle. These were lung tumors actually in uh, women with a hereditary cancer disorder. Um, and we actually think, and almost exclusively in women, and we actually think these are um, derived from smooth mus muscle of the endometrial lining that are then seeding these uh, sarcomas in, uh, in lung cancer. Um, we can also see how very nicely all the other cancers, this is completely unsupervised, how nicely all the other, uh, all the other um, tissue types really segregated um, into not just the, the, um, the, tissue of or the correct tissue of origin, but actually in the case of brain specific uh, components of the, uh, of the brain itself. I talked a little bit earlier about aligning reads not to the human genome reference. This is an example from a, a lung cancer project we were involved in, uh, in which we were actually able to completely reassemble the Epstein-Barr virus in what was diagnosed as a lung adenocarcinoma. This actually turned out not to be a lung adenocarcinoma. It was a lymphoepithelioma-like lung cancer. We stained this in the tissue. Only the uh, cancer cells lit up for EBV. Uh, but really, this was just data that came along for the ride when we did RNA sequencing. It resulted in a, a change of diagnosis. Um, really, if the DNA or RNA are in the tube, it's in there to be found, assuming you have the right bioinformatic tool uh, to run on it. Uh, just a couple of new slides this year. All these concepts we talked about from RNA sequencing are now applicable and doable at the single cell level. Uh, so now several commercialized technologies that uh, now will deliver unique cell-specific barcodes in a tube. So essentially you start with this tube of gel beads that contain unique barcodes. Uh, and this device, this is a 10x... Um, 10 uh, genomics technology, you basically have these beads come through a microfluidic channel and they get merged with essentially a single cell suspension of your sample of interest and these actually get merged into an individual uh, oil droplet and you burst first the, um, you burst first the, the reagent droplet and that, this will essentially deliver barcodes specifically to the RNA for your cell so you know which RNA comes from a single cell. And then you burst the entire oil droplet and then sequence them on mass. So this really has the benefit in that now you have this big mixture of RNA 
that can now be deconvoluted and mapped back to single cells. Uh, and the real benefit of this specifically in uh, cancer is the ability to reassemble um, not just tumor subclones, but also all the supporting uh, structure around those, um, the supporting microenvironment around those cells as well. Uh, so this is actually data from three, uh, from three people. That in, if you focus specifically on this plot, patient A2 is a patient with multiple myeloma. So each dot is a, a single RNA sequencing uh, experiment for a single cell. Uh, the other two are healthy bone marrow. So myeloma is a cancer of the bone marrow. And you can see that all the healthy bone marrow cell types are all clustering together. The patient's healthy cell types are also all, cluster, are also all seated in here. And we also had two very, very large populations that are patient-specific. And what you can actually, you can play this game, you sort of circle out specific cell populations, and you can look up the genes that are being expressed in, the, in each single cell. In this case, these are T cells. These are all genes associated with the T cell receptor. Uh, in this case, these are macrophages. All the genes expressed, most of the genes expressed with these cells are expressed in macrophages. And same sort of story over here. These are all neutrophils. And these actually turn, turn out to be only seen in the myeloma patient. Uh, and one of these is the um, sort of the clonal uh, myeloma cancer cell population. Uh, so this is a real opportunity, especially in cancer genomics, to take data from these admixed tumor populations and start to compare those with huge normal reference sets um, that are merging very similar to uh, GTEx. Um, one group that's really leading the way here is the Human Cell Atlas. So their goal is to basically assemble a huge compendium of all single cell data from all tissues, with a big focus on normal tissues. And this is a really incredible reference set, specifically uh, for cancer, because now we can take our lung cancers and compare them to thousands of healthy uh, lung tissues, for example. Uh, this is also a great funding opportunity. So founders of Facebook. So Mark Zuckerberg's group has now founded a group specifically for, founding, uh, for funding health initiatives, uh, including the Human Cell Atlas and trainees who want to work uh, specifically in the single cell, uh, cell genomic space. Okay, so I'm coming up to my last half hour, so I'll just come through um, some of the hereditary genomics group, and then we'll take maybe a two-minute break and then talk about the, uh, the case report at the end. Uh, Conceptually, this idea of two-hit tumor suppressors still holds. You know, I talked about these um, these genes that encode uh, regulators of pathways that um, are sort of the breaks of the cell. In the case of a uh, of someone with a hereditary cancer uh, cancer predisposition, they're actually born with one of these loss of function variants um, you know, right from birth. So in this case, here's an example. Here's that same canonical example of two chromosomes. But in this case, they're actually born with a mutation. In this case, they're born with a loss of function mutation in the retinoblastoma gene. And essentially, now they're only one hit away from developing cancer. And really, this idea of multiple types of cancer genome variation acting on the same gene really holds true in the hereditary cancer syndrome space, where there are many different ways where loss of the second remaining functional allele uh, can happen. A local event, sort of a gene conversion, you have recombination, just loss of that gene, or just lose this chromosome completely. There are many different ways that you can get the second hit, and these patients are very highly predisposed to cancer because really any one of these can lead to cancer in their case. Uh, of course, you can read this out in uh, next-gen sequencing as well. So here's a sequencing read stack from the match normal from that patient. This is uh, SUFU, so sort of a regulator um, of the Wnt pathway. In this case, they have a a loss of function mutations, they have a deletion of a single, uh, of a single base, uh, and that's in their normal DNA. You can see half the reads here have a deletion, and half the reads don't. So they still have a remaining functional allele, then have this huge deletion of that, that chromosome, they lose that second chromosome, and as a result in the tumor, every single read has that deletion, except for this one, this is one straggler uh, normal cell. But in this case, um, really there's only one copy of chromosome 10 left, uh, and that's because the, the tumor has essentially lost the remaining functional allele. So that's finding lists of mutations. So those are all the ways that you can look for variation in the cancer genome. Uh, but once found, the challenge is not just finding these things, it's really linking them to clinical action. Uh, and this is really by far the least automated part of bioinformatics, cancer genomics in general. How do you go from linking finding to function? Uh, so same sort of um, diagram I just showed earlier, but really the next step after you've run some of these bioinformatics tools, how do you annotate, interpret, and reporting these variants? Uh, so how do we do this? There are clinical guidelines um, for how to interpret and report a clinical variant. Um, here's sort of a list of some of the tools that we would run to interpret a, a variant. All these are now currently uh, reported in a sort of a text um, 
sort of a text paragraph back out to patients. Um, this is something for research, especially if you're looking at exome sequencing or, or whole exome or whole genome sequencing. You have thousands of these variants. It's very challenging to go through every single variant one by one and to do a sort of a bespoke or by hand um, interpretation of every single variant. So instead, we use uh, variant interpretation tools. Oncotator is one that I've used quite a bit, certainly we use for Cancer Genome Atlas. Uh, there are interactive desktop software that will also let you uh, review these variants as well. And online tools are becoming increasingly powerful uh, for annotating and interpreting uh, variants en masse. I think uh, Sarana has a whole talk on mutations and variant interpretation. So I'll leave it to her to go through how to find a mutation and how to interpret it. These are two that I've used. Uh, here's sort of a screenshot of the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics. There's a sort of a standard, so if you want to do clinical reporting, these are the guidelines that we follow that really follow a lot or use a lot of the um, tools and guidelines that I just outlined on the previous on the previous slide. The challenge for clinical reporting is this is really not scalable. So this is data from a clinical report at uh, Princess Margaret. The tumor had three mutations that had a certain mRNA accession number. It was heterozygous in all three cases, affected cDNA and affected protein. And then we wrote a paragraph for every single one of those mutations, uh, which is, you know, there's a lot of detail here. There's a lot of support for, yes, this mutation is important. Um, the challenge is if you have a thousand of these, no one really wants to read through a thousand of, uh, of these variants. And this is really where clinical cancer genomics is really starting to move away from the single gene, single variant model and much more into a more comprehensive reporting approach. Uh, one of the initiatives that's really driven this is the AACR Project Genie. Um, this was a really an initiative um, by American Association of Cancer Research to get all the data out of clinical labs and put it all into one place. So we could essentially search across multiple hospitals for what variants are being seen on these very, very large panels, um, on, these, on large panels across large centers, and how can we think as a group about how to interpret and report uh, these types of variants and start to uh, annotate these samples at um, essentially in a higher clinical, at higher clinical uh, detail. Um, so this group has been active for a couple of years now. There are seven founding groups. It's probably going to be out to 17 or 18 groups in the next year. Uh, so today, if you go to this website, there are over 38,000 uh, targeted panel tests, uh, data from 38,000 targeted panel tests just available for browsing. It's been very, very powerful we're looking at not just at the famous mutations, the GFR, BRAFs, but also at this long tail of infrequent mutated genes. And this has been a very important data set for us in research to start to resolve um, passenger mutations from driver mutations and to think about what new clinical trials or which targets could new clinical trials uh, go after, not just in single agent uh, trials, but also in, uh, in combination therapies as well. Uh, so sort of the last data side. What is that molecular report of the future going to look like? This is C-BioPortal. It's a data viewer that was developed for the Cancer Genome Atlas. It's now, especially within Genie, sort of growing into more of a clinical and genomic viewing tool. So the way to read this, you basically have a patient who has multiple tumors over time. Uh, clinical timeline at the top, I actually find uh, increasingly helpful, especially as we see uh, tumor, multiple tumors being collected over time. So here's the timeline. Here are all of the treatments they've seen. And it's actually been very helpful to see, you know, oh, these tumors are hypermutated versus diagnosis. What treatments did they have in the intervening time? Is there some reason that there was hypermutation from a treatment perspective? Uh, genomic landscape. So what are the copy number track? What are the copy number variants for these four tumors over time? You can see just by eye there are differences. Uh, and where the mutations lie specifically in these tumors? And are, are there unique private mutations in the a single tumor that aren't in the others. Uh, and then going back to this idea of annotation, having a handy table at the bottom that really gives you annotations at a click. Uh, having, uh, not necessarily, on, yeah, so having specific um, annotations, you know, is there a, a bioinformatics tool that predicts that this is, uh, this is pathogenic? Are there drugs or trials available? I'm really starting to grow this table out quite a bit more around what trials are available or what uh, other model uh, organisms are available to test um, basically to test specific drugs in these, uh, in these patients. So that's it for the first part. The next um, sort of half hour is uh, really going through this case study. So are there any sort of content or concept questions at this point before we go into the, into the case study? No? Okay. I will uh, move on then. So this is the, one of the very first examples of uh, personalized medicine using whole genome and RNA sequencing. Uh, it's published, uh, Jones et al. Uh, really looking at a very unusual 
um, adenocarcinoma of a, of a salivary gland. Uh, so initial presentation, this is going to be a single patient, uh, seven, eight-year-old man, no real reason that he should have cancer, fit and active, presented with throat discomfort. Uh, medical exam found actually a pretty large tumor at the base of the tongue, two centimeter mass, that's a fairly large tumor. Uh, no real reason, non-smoker, non-drinker, no reason to sort of suspect, like a head and neck cancer, for example, um, but he has cancer. Uh, PET CT scan and subsequent uh, biopsy, these aren't actually his, this is his H&E, this isn't actually his scan, but the idea that I've got a PET CT scan, this tumor really lighting up, as well as the draining lymph nodes as well. So really not only is the tumor itself positive, but that there's potential that this tumor uh, may have spread. Uh, I don't know if there are any pathologists who want to take a guess at what this tumor is. Uh, it's a mucinous adenocarcinoma uh, of the salivary gland. So eventually this is basically the first step. Get a tissue sample, review it by H&E, have conventional scanning and conventional pathology. So they had laser resection of both the tumor and the draining lymph nodes, the primary poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma, some pathology features. Uh, the nodes, three of 21 nodes are positive, so not rampantly metastatic disease, but positive for sure. Um, got radiation uh, to the primary, completed in February, and actually, actually worked for some time. Good quality of life, returned to work, the primary is now removed. Uh, but most concerning, where it became, came to the attention of oncologists that the at the uh, cancer agency was they started to develop, he developed numerous small, um, basically lung metastases in both lungs. So this is really quite serious. Clearly the tumor has left the salivary gland and now it's uh, invaded uh, his lungs. Uh, this is a much more serious um, medical finding. So the question is what do we do now? What treatments are really going to work for this individual? At the time they had um, an EGFR inhibitor trial uh, online. Uh, EGFR mutation testing wasn't, uh, wasn't necessarily routine. Uh, they ran a EGFR immunohistochemistry. chemistry. They wanted to know, does this tumor express EGFR? And if it does, um, before you give them an EGFR inhibitor, you of course want to make sure the tumor is expressing EGFR. Uh, not overwhelmingly positive, so cells will sort of turn brown when they're expressing EGFR. Um, but the answer is yes, so the question was what treatment could this, uh, this, patient, um, this patient receive? In this case, there were EGFR inhibitor trials uh, available. Uh, so one of the drugs available is called erlotinib. It's an EGFR uh, inhibitor. Uh, unfortunately, all of the pulmonary nodules grew well on erlotinib. So while this tumor expressed EGFR, um, this drug was just not necessarily um, uh, effective in this cancer type. In fact, the largest lesion really grew from one and a half centimeters to over two centimeters, and they discontinued pretty quickly. And they, there were really no other options at this point. They sort of exhausted standard of care. They had radiation. They tried a clinical trial with a sort of an early molecular um, result, but they're really talking palliative care at this point. And this is really where uh, researchers at the cancer agency came into play. The question here was: Are there other targets um, that could be tar that we could go after specifically in? Uh, in this patient. So I'm going to keep this little timeline going as we go through this. So presentation, head surgery, head radiation, lung mets were diagnosed. They began to grow. A lot of them failed. What next? So what are the targets in our case? So the exhausted standard, exhausted standard of care. They had an REB, which approved a protocol just for him, so an N of one case. Um, the patient consented to full genome sequencing with the understanding that they could suggest treatments. This, of course, is not a clinical test. It was a research study for a single patient with the goal to nominate treatments that could work. Uh, I talked a little bit about the challenges of formalin-fixed paraffin-embedded tissues for uh, cancer genomics in general. In this case, they took a fresh biopsy for RNA sequencing. So here's a nodule. A, here are the tumor cells, not the greatest stain, but um, basically the purple cells are cancer cells. Uh, stain. The aspirate had, had uh, tumor cells for analysis. They took a final aspirate. Pathology review, nice high tumor content, so overcoming that problem of tumor purity. 80% of the cells in the aspirate were, um, were cancer. And then for the DNA, they used the diagnostic block, formula fixed paraffin embedded DNA. And it came back with a pretty short list of mutations. Came back with a P53 mutation of sort of unknown significance, not really an obvious loss of function. They had an RB loss of function mutation. And the loss of RB specifically has been um, 
had been shown even at that time to result in gefitinib resistance. So this may be one reason why this patient was resistant to the EGFR inhibitor uh, right from the get-go. So having a comprehensive analysis right up front maybe would have avoided that treatment. And then mutations are really in two non-cancer genes that you really are variants of unknown significance. And these are variants you see all the time when we do whole genome sequencing, some mutation of unknown result in a gene you've never heard of before. Uh, and this is why we're going to have jobs for years and years and years, because we don't know whether these mutations have function or have clinical meaning. Uh, I suspect actually a lot of them do. Um, in this case, we sort of bin these two as, uh, as passengers. And we confirm those uh, the, uh, the clinically informative ones by a secondary method, in that case, Sanger sequencing. Just like I showed in that Illumina pack bio comparison result. Uh, here's one way to show copy number alteration. So the way to read this, all the chromosomes are ringed around the outside. The, um, the gains and losses are shown here. So reds are gains, I believe. Yeah, reds are gains, greens are losses. Uh, you can see here is the EGFR amplification. So this, again, really fits with the EGFR uh, expression seen in this tumor. Loss of P10, like I showed earlier. So you have this deletion of P10, also another indicator of uh, resistance to um, EGFR um, inhibition. Focal, highly focal RET amplification. You can see how small this is right next to this deletion. RET is at a very, very high level uh, in this case. And then other cancer genes as well. We have lots of uh, deletion of one copy of P53, deletions of other uh, tumor suppressors, amplification of the MAP, um, MAP kinase pathway. A lot going on. You do whole genome sequencing, you can see all of these types of genome variation, and some of them will inevitably hit, um, hit um, cancer genes. Uh, again, really wanted to validate what we're seeing by whole genome sequencing using FISH. So in this case, FISH is essentially a probe that will sit down on top of a gene, and you literally just count how many dots you see in each cell. So each cell for normal genes should have two dots. Uh, in this case, P10 had a single copy deletion, so for every copy of chromosome 10, you only had one copy of P10. Uh, focal ramp, ramp amplification, hard to see here, but many, many, many copies of RET in every single cell. Again, something that you can see at the cellular level, but also read out directly by next-gen sequencing. I uh, did RNA sequencing as well, and this is really where having multiple types of cancer, multiple ways to read the cancer genome uh, is really very informative. In this case, SMAD4 had extraordinarily low expression compared to a compendium of matched normals, uh, matched tumors and normals. Uh, so in this case, SMAD4 is deleted and downregulated. So if you just jump back here, there's this deletion of SMAD4, really recapitulated in the RNA sequencing data as well. And on the other end, RET was one, this is one of the most high expressors of RET we'd ever seen, 34 times higher than the rest of the compendium reference set. Uh, so very attractive druggable target, nothing you'd even consider in this cancer type at the time without some sort of uh, genomic analysis. And P10, same sort of thing. It's deleted and expressed at the low levels. So you have these two pieces of data that really um, sort of tie the story into a nice bow. Um, this list is helpful uh, because it gives us some feel of what genes are, are, active, in the, uh, are active in the cell. But at the time, to really make sense of what the druggable targets were, they basically took all the, um, the gene, basically all the uh, copy number data and the gene expression data and assembled it into a pathway. And this, to this day, is still the way that the personalized oncogenomics program is still thinking about and displaying these data in that they take a annotated canonical pathway and then they layer on the data for the patient. They layer on the copy number data, they layer on the expression data, and they sort of look at what pathways seem to have clusters of overexpression, deletion, amplification, etc. So in this case, there's RET oncogene was overexpressed. They saw deletion of this negative regula regulator of that pathway. Um, this parallel pathway was relatively untouched, so really they looked at the time that they um, had, since RET was overexpressed, the downstream uh, targets on that pathway are also overexpressed. Uh, but really, this seemed to be the most important pathway in this gene, not just because of the RET result, but of all the, the constellations of uh, genes and regulator, regulators, both activators and repressors, all seem to focus on the RET pathway. So they came up with a list. Here are the, taking all this genome data, it really boiled down into four or five um, bullet points. MAPK pathway is important, RET is important, what drugs could act on this axis. I uh, came up with a relatively short list, sinidib, satinib, serafinib, and slindac. Uh, and this is really where you present it to the oncologist and say, what could this patient bear? Which of these drugs is actually available? What trials are ongoing? Um, 
And she, choose, she chose sinitinib, and it really worked. So after four weeks on sinitinib, one of the four drugs on the, uh, on the chart, there's a 22% decrease in tumor size. So here's that original biopsy I showed you earlier, two nodes here. Uh, it took a month to do whole genome sequencing and all the analysis. So you can see during that month of analysis time, the tumors grew like this. Uh, started sinitinib right here, and then almost immediately within four weeks, you see the same tumor masses starting to shrink. So really this idea of knowledge of cancer genome variation, linking it to a drug, really the concept of the proof principle really appears to be quite promising. Uh, and he stabilized for uh, seven months. So they reduced the, clinically they reduced the, uh, side of the dose to reduce uh, side effects, otherwise great quality of life, sort of thing where he was thinking about coming back to work. Uh, but I started this entire talk talking about the inevitable resistance to targeted therapies, exact same story here. Then after seven months, um, or after four months rather, the lung mets began to grow, but we had all that genome sequencing data and we had three other drugs that could potentially be used. Uh, so I actually switched them to a combination of serafinib and Slindac, and again, stabilized the disease. So really hitting the same pathway in a different, uh, in a different way, or hitting some of the other alterations in a different way, uh, and continued for another, uh, another three months. Again, recurrent disease after seven months. So really this idea of hitting cancers on a single pathway in a single way with a single agent did not work, certainly in his case. Uh, in his case, actually recurrent disease, not necessarily in the lungs, but actually back in the primary site. So even though we had the tumor removed, that there were some residual tumor cells that were still growing or potentially metastatic cells from the lung going back and repopulating the primary. This is something that could be answered with genome analysis, not something that was done here. Uh, the other concern, a new nodule in the neck the lung mets are really starting to, um, to progress. There's new metastasis in the lungs. Quality of life is, of course, deteriorating. And the question here, genomically, is what has changed? Uh, so I went back in, I got another aspirate. Uh, so more cancer cells. So in this case, they have the neck mass. is something that's very accessible um, with a uh, fine needle aspirate. The exact same analysis, and came up with all the mutations and alterations that they saw earlier, in addition to these additional mutations. Uh, none of these are really known cancer, <laughs> cancer genes. They're all missense mutations. They're very difficult to interpret. There's no functional data around what these mutations do. Uh, and this is really the challenge, especially with metastatic or recurrent disease. You know, it's very hard to link even the function of these necessarily, you know, most of them back to, uh, to, as cancer drivers. No evidence whatsoever in the pretreatment biopsy, even at low frequency. If you're looking at the one read in uh, 50 or 60, there's no hint that these were there originally. Did the same idea. They took all the COP number alterations and mutations, mapped them back to the exact same pathway. And now you can, again, see this pathway is now light, it's just red hot. So there's COP number alterations, there's overexpression all over this pathway, as well as this parallel pathway as well. So in this case, the tumor's response to inhibit, inhibition of the, RAS, of the RET pathway was just to ramp up RET expression. So now you have insanely high overexpression of this RET pathway as well as a parallel pathway to achieve this, uh, the same biological goal. And this is really this idea of subclonal selection or these, this tumor dynamic that I alluded to right at the start really in action. You can see it in the real data, even just with a paired biopsy. And this is really where there just weren't great um, treatment options then or even now, actually. Do you consider a cocktail targeted drugs that have never been considered? That's completely not on the table. You can't just take drugs out of the medicine cabinet and give it to people. What do you do about these multiple pathways? Do you hit RAT? Do you hit EGFR? Are there other pathways that are also active? Uh, completely untested and there's a real risk of adverse side effects. Uh, he was the only one at the time to have this level of genome analysis. We didn't really have nice reference sets like Genie has today for what other treatments have worked in patients like him. Um, could we have detected these resistance mechanisms pre-treatment or during treatment? Could cell-free DNA have been a part of his uh, routine care? It's not currently, but certainly these are technologies that are really coming online. Uh, none of these mutations were evident pre-treatment, so this really speaks against the need, uh, against using small targeted panels to monitor these tumors, really the need to sequence even cell-free DNA fairly comprehensively to look for the acquisition of new drivers, new mutations. Um, do you think about serial biopsies or a blood test? Uh, these are this sort of the state of the art of uh, clinical genomics today. Uh, so here's his uh, timeline. Unfortunately, in the end, he en did enter palliative care uh, until he died, but you can really see the sort of the promise of clinical genomics to extend life and certainly quality, uh, quality and um, extent of life uh, with knowledge of cancer genome variation over time. Um, so I'll sort of leave it there, and we can take any final questions if there are any.
Athenses. Uh, so, uh, in, in practice, clinical practice, does, I mean, I'm aware of the thoughts about their supplements and the loss of their muscles, but could be, you know, some causes, platinum tissue destruction, block the door, and ask them to interpret genomes, which is not scalable. Yeah, I think the way forward is reference sets and bioinformatic algorithms. Uh, exactly. This was a PowerPoint slide that they put together, and they still put together more or less manually. Uh, this is sort of a ripe bioinformatics area for taking comprehensive genomic data and linking that to drug databases, not just for other patients, but also model organisms, cell lines, mice. They're huge, high-throughput projects that do pharmacogenomic screening. All those cell lines have comprehensive uh, genomic profiles. I think this is going to be the next step. Now we are good at generating high quality, high throughput genomic data from patients and you know, the 50 oncologists have all met in a room and I think there's a good process to do it now and the big opportunity is to think about algorithmically how can we now take patient data and share it across all the centers because we can't all sequence everybody. We need these huge numbers. Uh, but also to essentially build pathways like these. I actually think it's a very attractive way to think about and you know, nominate treatments, you know, for individual patients, but we, I think we need algorithms and it, it basically has to scale and it starts with, with big numbers and algorithms. Yeah, Anne. Yeah, I think it's the sort of thing, the skill set you learn this week, you can do this. You can call variants, you can you can look at DNA and data. Um, so I think the technical aspect is doable. It's that last mile to, okay, now you have a list, how do you interpret it? That's the that's the gap that needs to be bridged. Yes. So the current clinical state of the art is this table I just showed a minute ago. So it's this. Um, it's not a hard and fast rule. Some of the, you know, it's read papers. Is there uh, functional evidence? Has a clinical trial been done? It's really not necessarily black and white. In the very early days of Cancer Genome Atlas, it was purely frequency. You'd sequence 100 tumors, and which genes have more mutations than you'd expect by chance given the mutation rate. That was like the early definition of what a driver was. That's now become a little more nuanced because we don't always have tens of thousands of tumors to find a very, very rare but important driver. Um, and the functional data is actually still very, very important. Um, has there been a kinase assay? Has there been a mouse? Has there been a cell line? Um, so I think this is, even this paper at the time was like more, a little bit controversial, I guess, for like this is the way to interpret a variant, but it was something. and it, you know, this is really what we in the clinical labs will follow to interpret a variant. So I guess this is close to a rule set, I guess, or a set of criteria you're going to get, but that definition is going to continue to evolve over time. I think the genomics data in isolation is very challenging. I think you need that second experiment. You sort of saw in that case report. Every time there was a genomics result, there was validation by a fifth result, by Sanger sequencing, by some other secondary piece of data, even if that secondary piece of data is more genomics. It's DNA plus RNA. Those two together, that's a very strong argument to, be, to, to make. It's amplified and overexpressed. Okay, it's likely to be you know, functionally important in some way. But it's very hard to just say, I saw it, therefore it's a driver. It really needs something more. Yes? Uh, question. Uh, so let's assume that you have, uh, you know, some variants of unknown significant trait. How would you prioritize if you're functional analysis? Which one? Yeah, that's <laughs> sure. It's an unanswerable question. I think every lab will really do that in a different way. Uh, often, it's what 
understanding that we already have from colleagues, either locally or internationally, has some, the number one list of genes I actually find interesting when they're novel are, have they been linked to a net of disease? And is there a body of literature, even non-cancer, around it? Um, so this is all a cancer talk, but all these genes have been studied in another context. That's why they're in reference databases. Uh, so that's really to the top of the list in the unknown significance. Of the genes of unknown significance, the ones that have been worked on in another context are usually where I would start. Uh, I guess the other area is, is it being expressed at, abnorm ab at an abnormally high level given the cancer of origin? Um, so uh, the expression data I find is also the most informative for trying to inform what's important in the mutation landscape. Yes? Do you think the identity of the driver gene may change around the way what cancer was treated? Um, certainly in that new drivers arise, it's unusual to see a driver go away. Uh, it certainly does happen, especially if there's a large chromosomal deletion. Uh, but certainly acquisition of subsequent drivers, especially subsequent subclonal drivers, uh, I think that's going to be the main enemy as we get good at killing off clonal populations. Um, so the, I think once a driver, you're likely always a driver, but certainly additional drivers, uh, we need the ability to find and monitor those over time. And, and not just drivers, but also modifiers to existing drivers. So I, actually, I didn't mention this talk, but EGFR is the most famous there are sort of three canonical activating mutations in EGFR, and they all get treated with the kinase inhibitor. But there's a very distinct secondary point mutation that increases the affinity of EGFR for ATP instead of the drug. Uh, so that secondary mutation is not really a driver, it's T790M. Um, and it's not really a driver, but it evades the drug itself. Um, so it's sort of hard to bin everything to passenger driver, even though I presented it a bit that way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we used um, tissues from GTEx. Right. Or, or normal, just normal tissue samples. Right. Uh, but I'm just confused. So for an RNA expression, for example, when you are looking at the FGFR1 upregulation, um, do you know it's upregulation because you compare it with match normal? Uh, not, not, not necessarily matched. Um, a matched tissue, especially for cancer patients, is almost impossible to get unless it happens to be normal adjacent. Um, so especially for this type of analysis, tissue of origin, cell of origin work, um, because you have to rely on, on public data sets. Uh, where match normal is, I would say, basically mandatory is exome and RNA sequencing um, because there is just so much germline polymorphism that isn't captured even by the largest polymorphism databases, uh, especially regionally around the world. The, um, certainly, like the Middle East is not very well represented in dbSNP or in the public um, the public genotype databases. It's getting better over time, but really, whenever we think we found a variant of abundant significance and don't have a normal, my mind always goes first to it, we need the match normal to look at it. It's just it's almost always turns out to be a polymorphism. Um, so certainly for the DNA big panel exome or genome work. Uh, I think there you really want to match DNA control. It doesn't have to be matched to the tissue, so we'll always use blood uh, as the match normal. Uh, for RNA, certainly using the public data is really the only uh, realistic way to go. Uh, even normal adjacent, there's always a concern. Is it really normal? Is there a field effect? Are there tumor cells in that normal? Um, certainly valuable to have, but I think for this type of work, especially when you need brain, lung, thyroid, I mean, you're not going to get that from one patient ever. Um, so that's really where you have to use the public data. So match normal for DNA, public data for RNA. So for the study that you can still use other Yeah, so uh, just the... So, um, where's that compendium side? Yeah, so this is a real Franken. At the time, we only had 50 tumors in matched blood. This is really an imperfect reference. It was some of those tumors easily could have had very high GFR expression. Some of them were lung. Um, matched blood is very strange as a reference. 
but you really need something as a reference at the time. So the idea was basically to find some sort of baseline across this scrambled egg of, of, uh, of tissue types and then look for wild outliers. And that actually made this outlier really quite striking because despite 50 you know, cobbled together tumors and normals, it was still a wild outlier. That really makes that red amplification look very important. Uh, if we were to do this again, there's such a rich set of data from GTEx, from PCGA. Uh, you, don't, you wouldn't have to take whatever happens to be handy. You could really use a, you know, a lung reference set, a lung tumor reference set. Uh, you could actually do that in a, actually this is what they do in the POG project. They will do that cancer by cancer. Yeah. Sorry, I have sort of a nitpicky question about the clinical case. So that patient, when the choice is made to do for a lot, and if that patient still EGFR wild type, although only over Yeah, that's right. They're a wild I'm type. curious about why that was done. Was that before? It wasn't related? before EGFR. Like EG, the EGFR uh, correlation was known, but it wasn't clinically available. So it was sort of in this gray transition period between the discovery. At the time, there was a debate, uh, actually, Passy Janet wrote a great, top, a great paper, um, mutations are a fish story. Is it supposed to be amplification or mutation? That was still actually an open question at the time. Uh, so yes, in that case, if we were to do this all again, EGFR mutant negative maybe wouldn't have considered her lot. Then. Okay, great. Well, I'll be around at the break and uh, enjoy the rest of your week. I'm actually a past student of this program, so uh, highly endorse it. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you.